Which clause? The vested clause. Vested. Personally changed my life. Yes. <laughs> I don't know anything about that clause. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Not that vested clause. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1 of the United States Constitution instills the executive power in the president of the United States. The vested clause deals with presidential power and, in turn, affects our everyday lives. Unlike Article 1 of the Constitution, which clearly defines what Congress can and cannot do, Article 2 does not give a defined set of powers or limitations to the President. Instead, the President's powers are plenary. The power that has been granted to the President is in absolute terms, with no review of or limitations upon the exercise of it. Representative Peter Visklosky of Indiana's 1st District offered his insight regarding the wording of this clause. I would suggest that the ambiguity certainly gives the president uh, an advantage, if you would, but I also think it gives the president an option uh, to meet the changing circumstances of our nation. When the Constitution was written in 1787, the founders did not have an example to look to when determining how much power the president should have. Because of this, each president and his respective administration has separately defined the power vested in the executive. As a result, the United States has seen a wide range in the power yielded by presidents. During the Civil War with Abraham Lincoln, uh, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, uh, the issue of censorship, uh, he had a nation that was in civil war, uh, and there was a huge expansion and suspension of many constitutional rights by the executive. Uh, subsequently, uh, Congresses and courts acted to rein that authority in because the president really didn't possess it. Uh, you saw an expansion again at the beginning of this century uh, with Teddy Roosevelt, if you would. Uh, he certainly had troops uh, introduced in uh, Central and Latin America uh, with no constitutional authority. Uh, you saw President Roosevelt in 1933 declare a national emergency with no congressional authority to do so. Uh, ultimately, Congress revoked what authority the president assumed in 1947. Uh, but you also saw President Truman take over the steel industry. Uh, the courts made him take, give it back, if you would. Uh, you also saw President Truman have troops uh, fight in Korea uh, with no congressional authority. Uh, Vietnam is an example, although ultimately you had a congressional resolution after the fact. There are several political theories on this expansion of power. The most prominent disagreement among political theorists is whether or not the president's expansion of power has been in line with the original wishes of the founding fathers. What I think has happened here with the presidency is that the framers established certain principles about executive power and then uh, really thought that circumstances and the Constitution would interact. And uh, Tocqueville said it first, he said the Constitution created what looks like on paper a weak presidency. But as America grows in its position in the world and it gets involved in wars and they come to have an empire, which he thought was a good thing, um, the presidency's powers would grow too because that was the branch of the Constitution that was, in a way, designed to meet those circumstances. What would a constitutional presidency look like? If we return to the Philadelphia Convention, we understand that that was a generation that exhibited profound distrust of unilateral power. After all, they had lived under a king, King George, whom they considered to be a tyrant. And they knew through their reading of history that kings and despots and tyrants had often marched their people into war for less than meritorious reasons and had often asserted policies and programs which did not serve the interests of the public but rather reflected their own personal or financial or political agendas. And that is precisely why they wanted to sharply limit the power of the presidency, particularly in the area of war and foreign affairs. Contrary to the missives emanating from the White House and authored by OLC memos from John Yoo and others, who would have us believe that in wartime, the president has virtually unfettered power to conduct the war and to decide what the goals and policies of the war ought to be. 
As students, we have seen such occurrences firsthand during the administrations of the last decade. And relative to uh, President Bush, uh, he was active certainly uh, subsequent to the terrorist attacks of 2001, uh, but I would also characterize some of his actions as very abusive. Uh, the fact is, uh, I believe, uh, that warrantless uh, searches, uh, whether they be of people's pop persons or property, uh, whether it be as far as electronic eavesdropping, uh, is violative of the Constitution. Uh, I do not believe it is permissible under the United States Constitution uh, to torture people. Uh, I do not think it is permissible uh, or right under the Constitution to mislead uh, the legislative branch uh, prior to essentially authorization to go to war in Iraq. The reason the framers created a presidency, which was quite an innovation at the time, was so that there would always be a branch of the government in existence which could react quickly and swiftly to unforeseen circumstances. They realize, they said this in the Federalist Papers, uh, Congress and legislatures can't anticipate the future. So you need to have some branch of the government that can respond to immediate circumstance. Um, and the example they give in the Federalist Papers is war. Alexander Hamilton says in Federalist number uh, 70, I believe it was, that the one best example of where you need one person uh, in office at the time something happens to act immediately is the, what he called the management of war. We asked David Hurwich, a senior at Munster High School in Indiana, and a future Marine, whether he thought the president should have the power to commit troops to armed conflict abroad. I think that it should definitely rest with the president because just the way Congress has been working lately, they can't agree on anything, so nothing would ever get done. However, there are many other issues we are dealing with besides war. During this time, do we need a feeble or an energetic president? Relative to President uh, Obama, uh, I certainly believe uh, he is an active president, uh, and I think the great success you can look to as far as taking a divided Congress uh, and having effective leadership uh, is the adoption of health care. Uh, in retrospect, looking at the divisions that exist today, uh, that was a monumental feat of persuasion, of leadership, and of action. Uh, as we look uh, towards uh, 2012 and the events of 2011, people have suggest he is now enfeebled. Some have been feeble, acting with a more hands-off approach, while some have been energetic, acting on an expansive definition of presidential power. However, one thing that is certain is that the vested clause leaves open to interpretation the presidential powers that affect us the most.